Okay. So thank you, uh, first of all, to, to Pan for having invited me to speak and actually having been patient with this pandemic issue that first uh, my talk and my visit was scheduled in the spring, then we tried to reschedule it again. And now luckily we can do the talk online. So that's a good thing that technology allows us. Um, so today I will tell you something about uh, uh, my PhD, which I, I finished at the beginning of this year in, uh, in February at the University of Utrecht. Uh, so this is joint work with my former supervisor, Marius Kreinik. And uh, so as you can read the title, I will talk about formal integrability of geometric structures. Actually, most of the talk will be about this explaining this word here, geometric structure, because that's a very vague word. So we all know what it should mean in various examples, but there's not a single definition of what is a geometric structure. So I will try to introduce the formalism that I'm interested in, which is the geometric structure described by a pseudo group. And then uh, see which kind of question I want to I want to answer in this uh, in this setting, and in particular tell you something about this formal integrality. So let's start uh, uh, with something basic. So I will by the way I will use this graphical tablet. So if there is some mis some problem or whatever, hopefully sorry because it's the first time that I'm, I'm using it. Uh, so we start with taking M, which is a smooth manifold. And so we all know that, uh, what does it mean to have a smooth manifold? Well, in particular, M is, in, is, um, is, in doubt, is equipped with a smooth atlas, which I will denote by A. So this atlas is this collection of chart that goes from this open to Rn. So smooth atlas. So why do I want to write such a basic thing? Because I want to stress that the main property of having a smooth atlas is that the changes of coordinate should be smooth, should be diffeomorphism. So let me write that one. So the changes of coordinate are just this composition here, as we know. I write that they belong to diff lock of Rn. So by this notation, diff lock of Rn, I mean locally defined diffeomorphisms. So diffeomorphism between opens of Rn. So for every i and j, this holds. Now the key point is that many kind, many examples of geometric structure, they are defined by a smooth atlas where the changes of coordinate have something special, have an extra property. So you can say that they belong to some nice subset of this space diff lock of Rn. And this nice subset is what will be a pseudogroup. So I will now try to introduce you this definition of pseudo group and understand then what are, uh, which kind of geometric structure can be studied by this in, uh, in this way. So first of all, also from now on, I will write X instead of Rn. You can always think of uh, X equal to Rn because that will be in the case in most example, but the thing can be done in more generality. So you can study basically manifold modeled on another manifold if you want. But anyway, I'll just write X because it's easier. Uh, so let's define what is a pseudo group. So a pseudo group on the manifold X is a subset gamma, which is a subset of diff lock of, uh, of X, which satisfies certain properties. And well, of course, since I call it a pseudo group, then the property should actually have something to do with a group. So it should behave similarly to a group. And that's indeed the case. So such that, what are the properties? First of all, I want the identity of X to be in gamma. That's quite a standard uh, normal thing to ask. Then I would like gamma to be closed. Oh, sorry. Ah. Closed under composition and inversions. So in this sense, it is similar to a group. Any time I can compose the two diffeomorphisms, and since they are locally defined, this will not be all the time, but the domain and the codomain should match, of course. But when you can, then the composition is still an element of gamma. And similarly, we have diffeomorphisms, we can invert them, the inverse should still be in gamma. So this will be the kind of group-like property. But then there is also an extra kind of property, which is more shift-like. So we ask gamma to be closed 
under restriction and gluing. So this means that if you take an element of gamma, you can restrict it to a diffeomorphism on a smaller open set of its domain. This restriction should still be an element in gamma. And similarly, if you take many element in gamma, each defined on its own open, and then you assume that on the union of this open, there is a, diffeom a bigger diffeomorphism defined, which restricts to this smaller one, then this bigger diffeomorphism should also be in gamma. So this would be the kind of property that uh, defines what is observable. Now, before uh, giving uh, you some example, let me just say that the natural definition after that, in view of what I said uh, earlier over these, uh, these atlases, is that we say that a gamma atlas on, uh, on M is a smooth atlas on M such that the changes of coordinate belongs to gamma for every i and j. So simply that. And then we also call a gamma structure is a maximal smooth, uh, sorry, a maximal gamma atlas. Or an equivalence class of gamma atlas. So this is a such a, the nomenclature is such in such a way that if you take as gamma the pseudogroup with all the possible diffeomorphism, then you could just get a smooth atlas and a smooth structure with the usual terminology. And so this may look quite abstract if you have never seen it, but it is actually a quite natural way to to talk about geometric structure. Let me just give you a couple of examples so that you understand which kind of uh, of object we can study in this formalism. So if you take as gamma we can consider the element in diff lock R2n, and we ask that that they pull back the canonical symplectic form to itself. So this is just a, it means that it is a symplectomorphism. Symplectomorphism defined locally. So this is the pseudogroup of locally defined Simplex. Oh, sorry. I need to move this. Maybe I should do this. Uh, Simplectomorphism. Uh, so yeah, it is just a set of symplectomorphism. You check that it forms a pseudo group, and then what you see is that a gamma structure, uh, a gamma structure, is the same thing. of a closed non-degenerate to form on M. So this is called, also known as a symplectic structure, which for, of course is an interesting and important example of geometric structure that we want to have in this formalism. And this, this is what happens. I'll give you a second example so then it's clear what is the, the kind of pattern that we can see. So you can take as gamma, just write that it is, oh, sorry, there was a question? Or? Okay, maybe I heard something. If there is a question, please unmute, your, unmute yourself, there's no problem. Um, so uh, I say with gamma, we can take also the pseudo group. Pseudo group of locally defined isometries of Rn with the standard Euclidean metric on Rn. And in that case, a gamma structure is the same thing of a flat Riemannian metric on N. So what is the pattern that we detect here? That uh, any time that you can think of a canonical, of a standard, of a classical, easy geometric structure on Rn, then you can consider the set of diffeomorphism that preserve this structure in the most obvious way. And that set will form a pseudogroup. 
And now if you consider the gamma structure for that kind of pseudogroup, you see that uh, the, uh, this defines a geometric structure on M, so a global geometric structure, which is locally modeled on the geometric structure on our M. So this is the kind of slogan. Here we define this gamma structure, they are structures which are modeled on an easy structure on our N or an, on X. So, very good. This is just to introduce this kind of, uh, of setting that we have. What is the first uh, one first question, one first problem? That we see that this, uh, the kind of structure if we look here, well, they are quite strict in the sense that we ask that uh, a non-degenerate form it is closed. A Riemannian metric it is flat. Uh, sorry, again, I, I hear noise. I don't know if there is a question or uh, just somebody that forgot muting. Um, may, may I have a question? Ah, okay. Yeah, if you, if you have a question, uh, please. Uh, how to define arbitrary Riemannian structure yes. in, in this way? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's precisely what I was going to say. That, I mean, this definition is a bit strict because you only define flat Riemannian metric, for example. So what we would like, indeed, is to have a description of a geometric structure without this flat property, without closeness, so without this extra differential condition, in terms of the pseudogroup. And that is precisely what I'm going now to, to, to talk now. So it's good that, uh, that you, you noticed and you, you wanted to know about it. So let's say that the goal now is to describe uh, an almost version of gamma structure. And by almost version, I mean precisely what Anton was saying. So a Riemannian metric, not necessarily flat. A non-degenerate to form, which is also known as an almost symplectic structure, not necessarily closed. So the idea is that we want to, that, uh, that we want to separate some basic topological property of a geometric structure with the differential condition that we can impose later. And then study the integrability problem separately. But first of all, the first thing that is needed is to just define an almost version. And strange enough, this was actually not, uh, not really found in the literature in poor generality. So there were some attempts to discuss this, this notion of almost gamma structure, but they were always restricted to some specific kind of pseudogroups. Whereas one of the first things that, that we did uh, was indeed to try to get a general definition. So I'll try now to, to explain you that one. Uh, but to do that, I have first to do a small digression on pseudogroup because uh, the definition that I gave you earlier is very nice and concrete as a diffeomorphism which can be composed, inverted, etc. But it is less flexible for, what we, for the kind of work that we want to do. So I will first recall uh, a quite old result by Etliger, which uh, let us uh, interpret pseudogroups and gamma structures in terms of groupoids and principal bundles. And then using this formalism, it will be easier to, to reach uh, an almost version of gamma structure. So, theorem, this is due, as I said, to André Eppliger in the 58. So it says the following, it established some uh, bijective correspondence. So it says that given a manifold X, then we can consider the class of pseudogroups on X, which we have already discussed. And this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the class of effective et al. Li groupoids on X. Now, what are the objects I said on this, that I put on this right-hand side? So Li groupoids, now I don't know everybody in the audience, so I don't know how familiar you are. So let me just say a few words, so if uh, it is all very well known. So you, pro you are probably more familiar with Lie groups. Lie groupoids are an object with generalized Lie group in the, in the following way. We just have a multiplication which is only partially defined. So you cannot always multiply two elements in a Lie groupoid. But when you can, then it behaves exactly like a Lie group. And as a consequence of this, you will have not only one unit, like in a group, but you will have many units as many units as element in X. So the idea is that uh, you define Lie groupoid over an entire manifold X, and then you recover Lie groups when X is equal to just a point. You can give a more, also a more uh, uh, shorter but, uh, but more obscure description in terms of category, like a small category where every arrow is invertible. 
but anyway, I don't want to, to reach to give to this detail. And I also will not uh, discuss, for example, now what are effective et al. These are just two further properties uh, that you can ask on legal policy. But what I will do is that I will tell you precisely what is the groupoid associated to pseudocode, so that we understand this one-to-one -one correspondence. So if we start with gamma, which is the pseudogroup, the groupoid that we have here is what we denote by germ gamma, is the germ groupoid. And what are its elements? Its elements are simply the germ at the point X of phi, where phi are, L, uh, sorry, phi are element of gamma, and X is in the domain of phi. So what we do here is to just take all the possible germs of all the elements in X, in gamma, at any possible point X of a domain. So the germ is a very strict condition because I remind that it really encodes the entire behavior of a function around the point. And so this means that this is enough factory to remember the germ around every point to reconstruct the entire pseudogroup. And of course, uh, uh, I, so I should give, of course, uh, more detail about how these things really give uh, a legal point, but intuitively you can think that uh, since you can compose element in gamma, then this composition will reflect on the germ. So if you take the germ of, uh, of a composition, this is basically the same thing of the composition of the germ. And everything is internal because of the property of the pseudo. Anyway, this is an established result of how to explain pseudo group in terms of groupoids. And then there is a second part, which says that now fixing a pseudo group uh, gamma on X, we want to have a similar correspondence, but this time with gamma structures and some kind other object, which will be principal bundles. So I'll write now that. So uh, we have here gamma structures. Actually, let me write it in terms of gamma atlases on X. And this is in correspondence with the principal germ gamma bundles over X. Now again, what are these objects here? So here, germ gamma is the groupoid that we have discussed here. Principal groupoid bundle, well, this is something that, uh, uh, that probably, even if you are more familiar with the, the classical principal bundle with a Lie group action, in the groupoid world, you can generalize them in exactly the same way. So you have to make sense, what does it mean for a groupoid to act on, on a manifold? And then what does it mean for this action to be principal? But this can be done, it is quite standard, and it really works in the same, uh, in the same way of a, of, a, of a principal bundle for a Lie group action. And so also in this case, let me actually, instead of giving further detail, to just tell you what is precisely the germ, the, the principal bundle associated to a gamma atlas. So if you take A as a gamma atlas, then you will consider germ of A as a principal germ gamma bundle. Uh, also, sorry, here I did a mistake. This is not X, of course, it is M. So this is a principal bundle over M, and this is a legal point over X. So germ of A is the same kind of set described here. So it's the collection of the germ of all the charts in A at all possible points in their domain. And so again, what you do here is that uh, you know that since uh, we are working with a gamma atlas, if we take a chart and then we pre-compose it with an element in gamma, then we get another element in the chart. And similar, and this will reflect on the same thing of the in the same action for the germs. So if you have a, really a germ of a chart, and then you act with a germ of a diffeomorphism, then you really get uh, again the a germ of another element here. And so this action is nice, it's principal, and it really defines uh, a principal bundles in this sense. Then here there are a few technicalities. Well, first of all, here I should write something like up to equivalence. And here is also up to isomorphism and a few other stuff, but I don't want really to give you uh, these uh, this technical details. So the message is just pseudo group and gamma structures can be studied in terms of Lie groupoids and principal bundles. And now here we are getting close to the question, to the, to the goal I was mentioning here of understanding an almost version of gamma structures. 
so that then the, we can run this, we can reply, for example, to Anton question of what was a Riemannian metric not flat. So to do that, we have to uh, make this extra step of thinking that uh, the germ relation that we imposed is a very strict relation, as I mentioned. So since we want something weaker, we want an almost version, we can just try to impose a weaker relation. Anyway, what is weaker than having a germ? A germ remembers every, everything of a function around the point. What if we just remember the value of the function in that point and its first derivative? That's something much weaker. And this is known as the first jet. So we will try now to, to rewrite this part using only first jet instead of germ. And this would be basically our almost gamma structure. So Francesco, um, yes. before you move on, um, yes. could, can you remind me uh, uh, in your notation, the uh, M, what is the difference between M and X? One of them is the model so, space, I guess? Uh, yes, uh, the model space is X. So it's you should X. think of X uh, basically equal to Rn in all the examples. Okay. Whereas M is the manifold where the structure will live. So, uh -huh. so the, the gamma atlas A is on M. On, on M, yeah, exactly. Yeah, first so, uh, first I, I wrote, yeah, model on X. That could be the complete thing to write, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so I was saying now let's uh, um, let's consider this uh, weaker approximation. Uh, sorry, no, th this weaker version. So this approximation of a, of a gamma structure uh, given by the jet. So again, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar. So let me just write one line to saying that the uh, no the yeah the Taylor approximate. Oh, sorry, as I said, the, this pen is still not so. Easy to use if you're not used to uh, the Taylor approximation up to order one uh, of the element of gamma and of A is denoted by J1 gamma and J1 A. Here, write the word jet bundle. So, jet bundle are just the precise mathematical way to describe this intuitive fact that you just take Taylor approximation up for first order. And it is needed because then these, these are, will not just be set, what will be actually nice topological and smooth structure. But anyway, for the, if, you, if you are not familiar with those, you can just think that there are some notation for some nice spaces. And uh, what is the message then, then is that A. So uh, a gamma, a gamma atlas A induces a principal J one gamma bundle over M, which is just given by J one of A with this action of J one gamma. So here I'm doing exactly the same thing that I did here, but instead of taking the germ of the element in gamma and in A, I'm taking the jet. You can check that this is again a principal bundle. And it is moreover, actually it is a sub bundle of this bigger jet bundle, which contains the jet of all the diffeomorphism between open set in M and in X, which is a principal bundle for J1 XX. So now what we want to do is to just consider something which is like J1 of A without knowing that it is J1 of A. This will be our almost gamma structure in terms of the pseudogroup. So we forget that we have an atlas, but we do remember that we have a principal bundle which is inside this other space. So definition, an almost gamma structure over M is a principal J1 gamma sub bundle P inside J1 MX. So what I'm asking is just that I'm given uh, a pseudo group gamma on X, a manifold M, and then I can consider this bundle, this principal bundle, which is always there, I'm just considering a principal sub bundle for the, the groupoid J1 of gamma. 
I'm not claiming that there is a gamma atlas involved and that P is of this form. Of course, when P is of that form, then this will be a special case that we are interested to see. So P is called integrable if it can be realized uh, from a gamma structure A, meaning that P equal to J1 of A. So in that case, we really are in that situation here. So can I ask you something? Yes, of course. So you replace your frame band with just the Z band and then you replace your Lie group by J1 gamma. Yes. yes. And the integrability is exactly the same like the G structure case. So yeah, that, that, that's a very good remark. So he, he, uh, the, you can recover here the entire formalism of G structure, and you can do it that basically by taking a fiber of what of what you are working of of, of this guy. Yeah. So a G, a, a G, um, a, in a G structure, you have the group G, which can be seen as a groupoid over a point. Yes. So it is enough to take indeed as this pseudo group, a pseudo group which is built out of G. And then you take a fiber of the point here and you get precisely here's the frame bundle and here the principal sub bundle. So you get exactly a G structure. Okay, okay. Thank what you. is nice here is that it can be done for other kind of pseudo group which are not of the four. So gamma G are the pseudo group that gives uh, G structures, which are the, which are, let me just write it because it's a nice example. So they are the diffeomorphism such that their derivative belongs to G for every X. But not all the, all the pseudo group are nice and they behave in this way. Francesco, how did yes, you sir. figure out this concept? Uh, uh, sorry, how did you, do I feel? How did, how did you figure out this concept? Ah, how, how did, did we figure out? Okay, uh, well, I think principal, uh, sorry, uh, G structure were indeed the, the main inspiration. So as Johannes was saying, I mean, this was, this is something which is well known and uh, and we know that it works in this term of principal bundle. The main point I think was that uh, in the past when people were looking at, ga at general gamma structures and then they were, they were thinking of uh, what could be an almost version, they didn't have this machinery of uh, principal groupoid bundle. So what they were always doing is that they were assuming the pseudo group to be transitive, which is a condition that says that basically we fall again in the case of Lie groups. So what we did was just trying not to assume anything of the pseudo group and just working in full generality with groupoids. And if you work with groupoids, this is very natural. I mean, I don't think there is anything uh, deep or difficult uh, in it. Just that probably the people before, they didn't have this formalism ready. So they, it, was, uh, it was difficult for them to, to immediately. Very good. Yeah. So give some example, right? You should give some example. Yes, precisely. So I was just going to say, I mean, the example are the standard one that you can imagine. So I'll uh, just write a couple, but... Uh, Sorry, Francesco, before yes, you, of you give more, some examples, um, yeah. you only used first jets here, from what I understand, right? Okay. Yes, very, very good point. The second but, jet and the other jet will come, will arrive into the picture. Yeah, but I mean, just uh, uh, you, from the beginning, you can think of uh, some germ, uh, uh, sorry, some, some um, gamma structures, whose germ groupoids are not determined by the first jet, right? That's so correct. Yes. They will not be kept, they will not be well captured by, by this definition that you just gave. No, you, you're right. You, so what you're saying is that they, I'm not claiming that uh, this, this definition here captured the entire behavior of a, of, a, of, a, mm -hmm. of, a, of a of a gamma structure. This is only indeed the first order approximation. So you could very well be in a situation where you miss other stuff, and then you have to go to higher jet to get it. And this will be the, the, what we do when we do prolongations, if I understand your concern. Right, but uh, um, I don't remember if you made this distinction in your thesis, but would you not have to call the, the almost structure by a different name by referring to the order? So in principle, yes. So yeah, for okay. simplicity, so this uh, is what I would call almost gamma structure of order one, up to okay. order one. Okay. Indeed. No, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, my thesis, okay. I, I wrote that one. No Here, I will always consider just order one because that is where a lot of examples are. Uh, but, um, and then, I mean, yeah, when we, when we prolong, then we will see that in the, 
uh, soon. We will be clear how the, the higher jet comes into the picture. Okay, thanks. No, no problem. Are there other questions about the general definition? Okay. Then I'll uh, just as promised, just tell you, write down uh, this couple of examples which I anticipated earlier. So for, for gamma, the pseudo group of symplectomorphism and almost gamma structure, so the almost gamma structure equal almost symplectic structures. So two forms which are, uh, which are non-degenerate but not necessarily closed. The closeness condition will be this integrability condition which we set apart and we studied separately. And similarly, for gamma pseudo group of uh, isometries, then we have that almost gamma structure, they are Riemannian metric. Not necessarily flat. Flatness will be the integrability condition. And again, you can do for contact structure, for complex structures, polyacial, so all the G structures, but then there are also a few interesting examples uh, beside that, because you really allow this, uh, this pseudo group to be a general one, and not uh, necessarily of the form gamma G. So this is for almost gamma structure, but then there is indeed, that one should really, um, should really make sure to give a complete picture. So as Igor already was mentioning, one can say, well, but why do we stop at the first jet? we can actually go on and try to take approximation of a gamma atlas to higher orders, to higher jets. And this will be uh, what, uh, what lead us to the definition of formal integrability, which again was inspired by the similar definition which already exists for, uh, for PDEs and for G-structures. So let me say that um, for uh, any gamma structure, mm. uh, yeah, yes? Can you give also an example that is not goes to the classical distractions? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. The, uh, maybe Although I maybe it's complicated, but it would be useful to give an example that is not this gamma equal gamma s. Don't say for contact or almost complex, but something that... No, no well, con ah. con contact, I would say contactomorphism, that's a kind of example. Okay. Which is not a G-structure. Almost yeah. contact. This is still a G-structure? No, it is not. Because, well, because is it, UN times UN times one structure. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it yes. depends. <laughs> okay, we can discuss about it. I think. It's, uh, okay. it I think. Depend. I think. No, no, because I'm aware. I think that in the community. So I, I'm not at all expert in contact structure in general. But I think I, I know that in the community there are people that consider almost contact metric structures. So this is UN are, times one, and this is GLNC times one. Actually, I. I have citation. Uh, the yes, uh, sure, sure but then, yes, but the question is, uh, how can you interpret a contact structure as an integrable G-structure? Yeah, okay, okay. There, there's no, it's far away from integrability. There, the integrability is only, I think, if you ask the phi, uh, the, uh, if you ask delta phi equal uh, zero, where delta is uh, the Levi-Civita connection, then you go to this that are called, I think, co-symplectic, and this is the integrability in almost contact structures. Yeah, but you see, I mean, maybe, that's already what other people call almost co -symplect. No, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's very good to the point that you're raising, but that's, uh, I think the, the case of contact is already a case where it's interesting not to look only at G structure because yes, there, that's okay, okay. There, is, uh, there is something here which, which does not work like in the classical picture. There is actually, for example, well, probably you know that uh, Alfonso Tortorella, who is here with uh, Luca Vitaliano and Igor Udilevis, they develop uh, yet another formalism of homogeneous G structure to try mm -hmm. to include contact in this framework mm -hmm. because the, it's really not the same kind of behavior as metric or symplectic. Yeah, it's a bit different. Yeah, right. okay. okay, thank you. Okay, no, no problem. Um, so what I was saying, yes, was that um, a gamma structure A induces a tower of principal bundles. By tower principal bundles, I mean the following, that uh, we already have, as discussed, the principal germ of A and germ of gamma. 
this was a principal bundle over M. But then we also had the, took the first jet, and so we had this J1 of A and J1 of gamma. It was a legal void over X, principal bundle over M. So in between, we have all the higher jets, the one that we have not taken up to now. So a Taylor approximation up to order 2, 3, K, up to infinity. So just right here we have, uh, with this arrow, ta, 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 J, K of A, ta, 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 until J infinity of A. And here the same thing. J, K of gamma. And these are, I claim that they are all principal action. They behave exactly in the same way. So there's really nothing strange about it. And moreover, uh, by saying it is a tower, I mean that all these arrow here, they are actually surge actions. And uh, here there are again some technicality. All these arrow here, up to the infinity level, they are submersions. So they're all surjective submersion, except that this one here, they are a bit strange because uh, because basically the structure that you have to put on the infinity jet requires some cares. So you get a topology which is quite different from the one of the germ. But I don't want really to, to, give you, to, to go in this technicality for the moment. Um, let me just say that, so this is it's something induced by a, a gamma structure A. The game we want to play is the same thing of before. Assume that we don't have A, then what we have is that it's a something which will be a principal bundle inside J1 of MX, JK of MX, and J uh, infinity of MX. And so this gives rise to the following definition. An almost gamma structure P, which I remind you is, was a subbundle of this with the, the structure groupoid J1 of gamma, is called k integrable if there exists a principal j k gamma subbundle q inside j k m x so something at this level uh, such that the jet projection from Q to P is a surjective submersion. So what I'm just asking is, start for something at this level, which is not of the form J1 of A, just P. Integrability means that it is of the form J1 of A. K integrability is something much weaker. We only ask that uh, this comes not from something on the very top, but from something in between. So at the level K, there should exist this Q, this principal J, K, gamma subbundle. And we ask that the projection, which is just the one that forgets the higher order jets, will be a surjective submersion. And then, of course, uh, we call P formally integrable. if uh, it is k integrable for every k. So this is the kind of notion which, uh, which is interesting, which is almost integrability, but not yet. And now, it is not, uh, before, before going on, I will try to rephrase what I said just uh, uh, in a different way, just to make you understand that uh, these, uh, these steps that we, that we um, stressed, so the fact that we have an almost structure, then the formal integrability, then the integrability, they are really different in spirit and they require different kind of maths. So what I mean is the following. What we, so this is just a, a recap, there's nothing new with what I said. We have the class of gamma structures, which can be seen as a subclass of the formally integrable gamma structures. Oh, sorry, formally integrable almost, which in, terms, in, uh, in turn, they are just almost gamma structure. So 
if one is interested in the existence of this geometric structure, one should say, okay, I would like to know when there is a gamma structure on a certain manifold. That's very difficult. Then let's say, okay, let's split the problem. First, one should look at if there is an almost gamma structure. Well, this means that if there is a principal bundle in certain, in certain ways. And this indeed is a problem that, uh, uh, which I didn't read with, but uh, that it is, I'll just write here, topology. I mean that there are topological results in terms of characteristic classes and so on for the existence of this kind of object. What we want to do then is say, assuming that we have already given an almost gamma structure, when does this come from a gamma structure? So we want to find this arrow here, which will be the integrability problem. But now again, this is also difficult. So we say, let's split the problem again in two. Let's look just, first of all, at formal integrability, which is something in between. So this arrow here will be just the formal integrability problem. And this is the part where there is some geometry. And so I will tell you just a few things more about this. And then, well, there is the extra arrow. So the one that I haven't mentioned up to now. What is nice is that this arrow here is true in many cases. And why it is true? Because we have some result, like I'll just write a few names, like Robenius, Darbu, Newlander, Nirenberg, etc. So these are all kinds of results which can be rephrased in this term by saying a formal integrable almost gamma structure is, comes from a gamma structure. Um, and they all require some kind of analysis. So you have to solve some ODEs or some PDEs. So the word you have to write is analysis. Oh, analysis. And so this is also a very interesting uh, problem, which is separate from the other one. Uh, I, like invariance, spin shovel, et cetera, right? Sorry? In the last uh, vector, you can add also jitter structures, spin seven structures. Uh, so, yeah, because you mean for, the, for in, in, in that for that kind of structure, this arrow is always true. That, that's what you're saying. I mean, from all your vectors, I mean, for this structure, still makes sense. You have the ability, you have non integral case. Yes. Yes. No, no, I, I mean, I agree. What, I, what I'm saying is that in, in yeah. general, you, you do not have a, you do yeah. not, there is not some result that says any almost uh, gamma structure which is formally integrable is also integrable if there is this condition but in many examples this condition is true or yeah. it is known what is the obstruction yeah but there, actually there is these structures we have to, that we don't have integral case for j lee group for, so for, for me yeah i mean there, there are indeed for the lee groups we know that for all the for the classes for example of elliptic group this is always true and uh, Okay. I'm not sure if I understand your comment. No, 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 you are right. I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there, there are many results which says that under certain conditions, this is true. Yes. What is not there yet, and this, for example, is something that, that I'm interested in. I, I looked a bit into it. I, I don't have yet a result. It's really to say, is in this formalism, is there something in terms of the pseudo group? So can we say that if the pseudo group has certain properties, then this error is true? And uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I don't want now to talk about that in case you, you can ask it later. But uh, yeah, for the moment in the rest of the part, I want just to tell you something about the geometry here. So I will present indeed the result, a result for formal integrability, which if you know how it works for G-structure, again, it is nothing surprising. So I will just build some analogs of the intrinsic torsions. But what is nice is that you can really do it in turn only on the observer group. And the way that you do it, introduce some object, which for me was even more interesting than the actual, uh, than, than the actual result itself. So I'll try to, to tell you this last part. So let me write the theorem. Which says that uh, let P be an almost gamma structure. Oh, oh screen what happened here? I stopped screen sharing. Okay. You uh, share yes. screen uh, again. Maybe it's something oh. uh, connection is a uh, loose. Uh, you lost the connection to yes. That's oh yeah, but now it's oh, gone. Yeah, but yeah, but now it's the white blackboard. Mm. Sorry, wait a second. I'll try to. But did I close the file by mistake or? Uh, 
would you like to oh okay okay maybe i found the file back sorry i think i am there uh, share screen again here okay i think i'm back in the yes right. okay sorry I, I don't know what i clicked <laughs> um so i was saying let p be an almost gamma structure on m um then there is a sequence of vector bundles which i denote by a curly h i of gamma over m and of global sections tau ip uh, yeah, of, of these vector bundles such that p is formally integrable if and only if all this tau i they are zero. So, as I mentioned, I mean, this is uh, uh, in, the, in the example that we had before, I mean, this will just give back uh, the standard, the standard uh, intrinsic torsion, for example, for G-structures. So this kind of obstruction that, uh, that you can get. What is, I, I say, for me, it, it is much more interesting than the result itself is how we arrive in the proof. Because uh, you, can see, you can see already from here that these are result for formal integrability, but it is uh, some recursive, uh, uh, there is some recursivity behind. So this should be something that uh, you can look at the first order uh, obstruction and then go on with the second one, with the third. So it is actually a result for one integrability, two integrability, three integrability, and so on. And the way that you can do this recursive process is by way of prolongations. Now the problem is, what do I mean by that? So let me just I'll try to idea of the proof. Um, so, the main step is to say that if we start from a principal bundle P for this groupoid, we would like to find something here on the top, which will be a, gamma, a J2 gamma bundle over M. And we want this error to be a surjective submersion. So this would be the one integrability. So like uh, find this question mark uh, such that this is surjective submersion and this will lead to the first obstruction tau one then in that case when this is zero then one can repeat go to the second obstruction and so on so the problem is how can i reach how can I define such kind of element? You could try to guess something in terms of P. And this indeed, it can be possible. But what you see is that uh, there is really a lot of stuff there going on, which is not really needed. So this P was something inside J1 of MX. And this question mark should be inside J2 of MX. But what I claim is that you do not need the entire structure of a jet bundle here. You need only some very specific data which is the one that will make you run your, your, your engine. And, and so what we did was try to define some kind of more abstract object encoding this structure, this geometric structure that we have here. Forgetting that we are working with gens. Let me try to be a bit more precise. So first of all, I recall you that any jet bundle um, is endowed with a Cartan form. Now there are many ways to introduce Cartan forms because there are also uh, yeah, there are many equivalent ways to, to define them. You can define them in coordinate or explicitly with some intrinsic formulas. But uh, yeah, what is um, what we should just say is that it is a one form with coefficient on the jet bundle 
which for, is used a lot from the, in the TROPDs. So it can be used to encode solution, to study symmetries, and other very interesting and important problems. What we claim is that the Cartan form adapted in this formalism really have all the property we need for solving this problem. In particular, here we will have two kinds of Cartan form, one on this jet bundle and one of this other one. And this will actually be a further special properties. So uh, J1 gamma inherits a Cartan form from J1 XX. So, okay, that's obvious. Which is actually not only a, a differential form with the property of the Cartan form, but I also say which is multiplicative. with respect to the groupoid multiplication. So this means that there is some algebraic relation of this form and the multiplication of this groupoid. And this is inspired directly from uh, Poisson geometry, because if you are familiar with Poisson geometry, then there is a nice object, which is called the symplectic groupoid, which is the integrating object of a Poisson manifold. And that kind of groupoid works in a similar way to this one. It is a groupoid with a form. In that case, it was a two form because it's a synthetic form, but it has the same multiplicativity property. Just that in this case, the multiplicativity is a bit more complicated because there are coefficients involved. But this can be take, taken care of. So we have this nice Cartan form here. And then similarly, P also inherits a Cartan form from J1 and X. And I also claim that this, which is multiplicative with respect to the groupoid action. So P is not a groupoid itself, so of course it cannot be compatible with that one, but there is an action here. So I'm claiming that the form that you have on P have a, nice, have a nice relation with the action here and also the form that we have there. And this also is inspired from, from Poisson geometry because also there you have the notion of Hamiltonian action, Hamiltonian action of a symplectic groupoid on a symplectic manifold. And so in that case also you can make sense of some nice relation which is similar to the multiplicativity that we have there, just in that case it is without coefficient. Here there are also coefficients in the action. And now, finally, we can uh, try to abstract these notions, forget that we are working with Cartan form and jet bundles, but only remembering that we have a Cartan, we have a differential form with these multiplicativity properties and a few further properties which I will, will not mention, but uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is less relevant. So what we get is that we get that a Pfaffian groupoid is uh, so let me just say Pfaffian groupoid G omega is the abstract notion encoding J1 of gamma. So this part here, I claim that it can be just described in terms of a groupoid and some nice Pfaffian form. This was a concept introduced by Maria Salazar a few years ago to really study this kind of, uh, of structure defined by a pseudo group. But it can be, uh, one can do even more than that because we can say, okay, on the other side, we have this here, this bundle. So a Pfaffian vibration, P theta, is the abstract notion encoding P over M. When I say P over M, I mean P with the, the Cartan form in the, uh, inherited by that one. So this notion of Pfaffian vibration, uh, we described in a paper that we have together with Maria Marius called the From PDEs to Pfaffian Vibrations. And, uh, and this is, did, again, is the concept that lies behind a PDE. So you can really, instead of trying to define all this classical construction for PDEs like prolongation, you can try to define at the level of Pfaffian vibration. And then you can put the two things together. So, together, they give rise to the notion of 
principal, Fafian bundle. So a principal Fafian bundle will be just a Fafian vibration and a Fafian groupoid with an action which is multiplicative in this term. And this is the kind of object that allow us to explain this general theory. So this is what I claim that is a nice way to study this geometric structure and their integrability problem. So because with that one, one can just, uh, uh, let me just exactly conclude in this way by saying that uh, uh, we develop a general theory of prolongations in this abstract setting. And so it is understanding this kind of object that we can get a natural candidate for this question mark here, and then understanding which are the obstruction is, uh, for, uh, for, for, for this higher integrability, for these higher prolongations. And, um, and yes, and let me just say that to, uh, to conclude that, I mean, this kind of object is what also uh, I would like Aquinet to investigate more to understand the other error that which, I, which I mentioned earlier, the one of, uh, of uh, the analytical one, so to try to get some result uh, where to say that uh, this kind of principal Papian bundle defined really a gamma structure. And that there are a few also related questions uh, which I faced, for example, about the Morita equivalence. So Morita equivalence is a nice relation between the groupoids. So one can say if you have uh, two pseudo group which are Morita equivalence in this relation, what can you say about, uh, about geometric structure? Are these things also equivalent in a sort of sense? Is uh, integrability also invariant under this, uh, this problem? And, uh, and yeah, I think there are many, many things that the uh, deformation would be another, uh, which I, I haven't looked yet into it, but it would be another interesting topic to, to look at. I think that, I mean, yeah, this, uh, this kind of formalism could have, uh, could have new things to say about, uh, about this sort of problems. And uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the time is up, but uh, more or less I said uh, what I want to say. And maybe I was maybe a bit quick and vague on this last part, so sorry, but uh, thank you for the attention. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, let us find the speaker. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, do I understand? That means that's a, a, a pupil in a, a classical a geometry like a gin man and uh, many mm -hmm. people only consider a certain thing, but in different language, like, right? So, and uh, you organize uh, in a yes, uh, uh, language of a group poet. Exactly. And they I mean, didn't use a group poet, but they use a kind of prolongation. Uh, some kind, uh, I mean, that's a very complicated uh, PD invariant, something like that, right? Yes, so, so what is the advantage? Uh, that means that uh, um, you can see something better uh, than term or, uh, or check is a... Uh, what's uh, Do you hope that to get something more new? So, yeah, so I think that one, one main point is, uh, is related to what, um, to what uh, Johannes was mentioning before. That I mean, these people like Gilleming, Stenberg, Kobayashi, there is a lot of studies in the, in the 60s, the 70s of classical results about, uh, about this geometric structure. But uh, let's say the main, I haven't written here, but the, the, main, uh, uh, the main hypothesis that they work with is that they always ask, so they ask gamma to be transitive. And now a transitive pseudo groups means that you can always consider, uh, consider two points and get a, a different order to send one into the other one. And this is very good and very nice for a, for a lot of examples, but still it is quite restrictive. Now, for example, I mean, indeed, uh, when, when I mentioned contact structure, I said that is debatable, but contact structure is still, it is defined by transitive pseudo. But then one can try to look also at other examples which are not transitive. Mm -hmm. So from Poisson geometry, for example, there are some, uh, some kind of structure like these uh, log symplectic structures and other kind of Poisson structure, which uh, are indeed, uh, they, they do not have a single local model. So they can be defined in a singular foliation. Again, there's another example where the foliation do not have a singular model, do not have a, have a sim as a unique regular model, but there are more than ones. So in that case, the pseudo group describing those kind of objects are not transitive. And then you cannot reduce them to a group. You really have to use groupoids to study those. And, there, and that is why, where, I mean, the, the, the techniques and the, and the result of, of Gil, I mean, and Stenberg and the other people fail. I mean, fail simply because, I mean, they only work in this, uh, in this kind of hypothesis. 
And what we were trying really to do, inspired indeed by, by the result and by PDEs and other, and other things, was to try to get some formalism which could formally work for any kind of example. There is still stuff to do, of course, because I mean, I do, I do not have yet uh, uh, re some result on those interesting concrete examples, because mm -hmm. first we had to establish the general formalism, of course. Yes, but, very uh, good, yes. very nice. But you just mentioned about sing uh, for, uh, singular fallation and the main approach on singular fallation. So, so which approach on singular fallation? Yes, that's a, 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 a I mean, that's a, a single, uh, that came from the definition of the um, Lee bracket of the vector fin, right, the closer of the module, I mean, standardist. Yes, Ah, yeah, yeah, you mean, yeah, that definition. So, so what, what is the question? I, 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 I asked you, this is, they also construct kind of A-infinity structure on such a thing, or, I mean, a, do you get some new invariant or some, uh, oh. because I mentioned, that's a, uh, on, uh, uh, singular fallation, so I asked you. Uh, okay, uh, no, that I don't know. I mean, they, uh, yeah, I, I know exactly yeah, that these people work on that. I'm not an expert, really, in, uh, in foliation, so I, I don't want to say stuff that... Uh, would be very wrong. I mean, I, I just know that, I mean, this would be one kind of example which would be interesting to, to, to look with this formalism because they are naturally non-transitive. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know about these yeah. higher, higher things, but I have to say. So is there more some question to um, Francisco? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes. So Francesco, you were talking about um, uh, local integrability, so that's one step beyond formal integrability. So, and uh, a formal integrability is not sensitive to this um, non-transitivity because you only work at you know, over one point. Uh, uh, so, so anything that has to do with uh, non-transitive examples must involve this uh, lo local integrability. So in integrating in, in, uh, in, in neighborhoods. So right? let's see, I see what you're saying, but uh, yeah. You mean, I was thinking, so it means that in, in this kind of problems, uh, if you had something which is non-transitive, then... Uh, I mean, you could look at the orbits on, on, uh, on M. No, of course, of course, yeah, and then you restrict to the... Or, sorry, orbits on, on X, or your model space, under the action of the, of the groupoid. Uh, and then you have a, a di maybe different... Uh, story about the, the formal integrability at, the, at, at those different points, but uh, they would not know anything about each other. Yes. Yeah. Okay, no, so, you say, yeah, on the global picture, you, yeah, you don't, because you always, uh, I, I think I get what, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. uh, you were saying that you were trying, you had been thinking about some, uh, so, some results that would give you local integrability under some nice conditions on group rate. So how far? Yeah, so then, yeah, okay. Uh, then you, uh, would they, would such things work in, in the, the non-transitive cases you're, you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. So let's see, uh, my idea for, 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 this, for, this, for this thing was basically to use uh, uh, some result uh, um, which have um, uh, from uh, Janusz Markutz and uh, Roy Bang over PDs with symmetries. So their idea is basically that uh, they can prove some rigidities result on some kind of uh, writing some nice PDEs on, uh, on vector bundles, saying that if you have an infinitesimal rigidity, then this is enough to prove uh, uh, the actual global rigidity. And now why this is relevant for, for my picture? Because I have uh, basically, let me write here uh, this thing. Where is the, I, sorry, I had the pen on the other side. <laughs> um, I know that P, is integrable as an almost gamma structure, if and only if, for any point in P, there exists sigma, which is a section of P, lo a local section, mm -hmm. which is holonomic, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, sigma star of theta equal to zero. So this, I mean, some uh, easy thing to prove that says that just integrability is enough to find uh, solutions, local solution around every point. And now, starting from this characterization of integrability, I can basically see that uh, this leads to some nice uh, non what that we call the nonlinear Spencer sequence. This is some kind of sequence that you build at the level of uh, Lie algebraid and of the and the coefficient of the Cartan form, basically, 
Um, and you can see that the, if that sequence is exact, mm -hmm. then you really get integrability in that sense, in this sense, because you really can, um, you basically having exactness of that sequence will allow you to start with your P, start with any sigma which is not holonomic, take any bisection which is not holonomic, multiply them, and then impose holonomicity on this product. So you want to, to deform a non-holonomic section into an holonomic one. Mm -hmm. This would be the, 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 the goal how to reach it. And what I saw is that indeed, I mean, having this non-linear Spencer sequence, having it exact is enough to reach this one. The problem now is then to just move to, to study what is this non-linear Spencer sequence and when you can really say something about exactness. And what I hope is that because this really looks like something of the kind that you have zero form on M with coefficient in A, uh, one form with coefficient in, uh, in E, and then another piece. So this looks like precisely the formalism of these PDs with symmetries that was used by, by Marcus and Bang in the, in their, uh, for the result. And their result on turn, the, because maybe you were saying, where is the analysis there? The yeah, analysis, is is based, exactly, the analysis <laughs> is based on this uh, Nash-Moser technique. Uh -huh. So there are these, uh, these results by the, uh, in the formalism of Hamilton, which, uh, which talks about a, a sort of inverse function theorem for Frechet space, uh, tame Frechet space. So the hypothesis they use is that certain space and certain map should be tame. So they should go to, go to zero in a very strong way. And here, you may guess that there could be something similar. So the spaces uh, that, uh, that one should use uh, is not clear yet what they are, but it, should be some, it could be some kind of cohomology that you define using this sequence. And then you may ask if it goes to zero in a nice equivalent way of tame. So is there some ellipticity condition that will be involved here or, so, or something more relaxed? Uh, so I don't think that ellipticity is involved directly there. Mm -hmm. But uh, ellipticity, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the elliptic case would be the other case where I was thinking of actually looking it. So I see. Okay, say, so it's uh, kind okay, of just restricting so. exactly just restricting to the class of elliptic pseudogroup mm -hmm. because that is known what how you how we should work there, and then try to see if with that hypothesis uh, you can really do something maybe using the same thing of of uh, holonomic section and bisection, but uh, not necessarily using directly the Nash-Moser techniques. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So Francesco, is that part already written in your thesis or not? So yes, yeah. This, so as I, as I mentioned, I mean we have a, a paper which is where we talk just of this part of Papian fibration and prolongation, where there is I mean, already quite some stuff to say, and the rest which I mentioned, it is on my thesis. We are also writing a paper about it, but I mean it will still take a bit of time. So, but you can read yeah, it online. It is, it is yeah. public. Okay. If there are no question, more, let us thank the speaker again.